The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, folks. Uh, welcome to Designing Interactive Systems 2. Uh, let's recap what we did last week, real quick. Uh, what did we talk about last week? Anybody recall? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, we talked about input devices and how we can classify them. Right, input devices, how to classify them. We had a design space. So what were a couple of dimensions of this design space? Like what, what could you put an input device into? Like what were classifying criteria? What do you think? We had uh, position thing and uh, rotation. And yes. Then. So linear position change and, and rotational position change. Yeah. And then we had uh, absolute. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So all of these basically are combining with each other um, to to form a multi-dimensional space, which we were kind of like mashing down into a two D table. But in reality, of course, it's it's actually many dimensions. So rotational versus linear position versus uh, force, and absolute versus relative. And then there was the resolution of each of those sensors as well um, to classify things. Right. Um, the design space was sort of um, a, a mathematical approach. And remember that if you have an actual input device uh, that, uh, that you, you look at, it's actually a combination of these points, right? Each point is an individual you could call them effector like, or, or like component of an input device, like a button or, or a scrolling sensor or a scroll wheel or something like that. Um, and uh, in order to combine these, we had different kinds of connections. Uh, how could you, there were like three different ways to connect these input device uh, pieces. Yeah. Uh, Uh, you now, now that sounds a little bit like the model view controller. No. Um, yeah, so comp uh, we had we had layout for sure, merge right. So layout just putting stuff on the same box right. Uh, merge when you actually cannot separate the two sensors like the X and Y sensor in the mouse, and then the third one, connect right. That was when you take the output of one uh, device and feed it into another stage of the input device. Uh, that almost always happens if you look at it when you when you connect the input device to the computer and it does more things to the to the input data, um, and that uh, will actually be part of today's topic. Like what happens with that data once it goes from the input device into uh, you know the computer, the hardware, the drivers, the OS. What is happening to that data in order to make it useful for an application? The other thing we talked about was briefly. Uh, user interface programming paradigms. Um, if you had to explain to somebody who has only had like you know the the basic education of like school programming, you know, writing you know apps in like a single language, maybe writing down algorithms, like the stuff that we do, for example, in our introductory um, you know programming classes here at the at the university, um, what would you tell them about like how they have to rethink? The structure of their program when they are trying to write a GUI app and they're trying to use a, a toolkit an environment like you know, Java Swing or you know, Windows um, or Mac OS in order to actually form a, you know actually write an application that processes um, graphical user input events. What's what's different about the, the program structure from your average you know, run of the mill piece of code. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have your typical program structure. Um, I think you explained it in a way that you have like sort of a main loop, mm -hmm. and then uh, all the functions are so called event listening functions, mm -hmm. and they listen uh, for an event, for an event to, to happen, and then they catch the event, and then right. the corresponding handler is uh, executed. Right. And then they just handle it. So we have this, uh, you know, the, the the key thing maybe to remember as a concept from what you said that's correct uh, is, is this callback idea, right? So that there are, there is a main loop that is essentially just trying to make sure that it catches all the events that are coming in from the user as quickly as possible and generates also, you know, some kind of response to that by calling 
the appropriate callback function. Um, but all the actual reaction to what's happening to the application while it is running is happening in these callbacks. And they are called, you know, at, at will basically based on what kind of events are coming in and how these are mapped into callback functions. And we'll actually see that Windows systems and, and, um, and user interface toolkits that you use to write apps will usually have a way to map these events to these callback functions. You know, because standard example, you know, how do you quit an application? It could be a whole variety of different ways of doing that, completely different events, maybe a mouse event clicking on a closed box or something else, and uh, you know, some keyboard shortcut, some menu selection, um, you know, selecting the quit uh, menu item. And all of those ultimately map to the same piece of code that, you know, properly shuts down your application. And that mapping is something that maybe even a, a user might want to, to mess with, right? So maybe the user wants to go in and actually change some of these keyboard shortcuts because he's used to always using, I don't know, control X to quit his applications and, and now he's on a Mac and he needs to press command Q and that's confusing the hell out of him. So he wants to have that changed. So if there is, a, you know, many systems offer a way to actually change that mapping from these events uh, that are coming into the functionality that is triggered by um, by the event. So we'll see how that works um, starting today. Uh, I wanted to go back to uh, one more thing that's a quote from Stu Card who did the design of input uh, devices um, and uh, we found this nice uh, citation. There's a, there's a wonderful book called Designing Interactions um, that Bill Mogridge wrote in which he basically went out and interviewed all these people who, who built this, you know, these cool early user interfaces, many of them we've talked about in DIS1. Uh, I think I recommended this book as a Christmas present uh, to go onto your Christmas present list uh, for Christmas in DIS1. And one of the quotes here from Stu Cart was that he said like, you know, since he, he came up with this um, idea of, 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 of mapping, uh, you know, trying to figure out how good is the mouse as an input device, right? And, and the design space of input devices was sort of one of the tools that he developed with his colleagues in order to measure that. And he said, this is the, the great way how, you know, the science could work. It, uh, you do need good designers to do the design, but, um, you know, they could help structure the design space, um, you know, to help people discover things more quickly. Uh, the, uh, understand their design options more quickly. Um, so the science didn't design the mouse, but it provided the constraints or the design space to do it. It's a nice way of thinking of it. Um, by the way, since you know it all ties together, uh, when Card was actually um, trying to understand um, the factors that make up good or bad pointing devices, he went back and used Fitz Law to understand that and to reason about these these effects. So. Um, I recommend if you don't have that, you know, that book yet, uh, go online. Some of the chapters end up being online occasionally on the, on the book website. Uh, and uh, reading that uh, short article from Stu is an interesting read. Now today, and we already started looking at this very briefly last time at the end of the class, uh, we're going to take a look at this Windows system architecture. Um, what is it? Well, it is basically a reference model. So um, it's, it's a somewhat idealized layer model of how a complex window system works, right? Um, and uh, the actual systems that we will see, um, none of them will be structured exactly like this and have the exact these layers in this exact same order. But oftentimes you can identify which part of the functionality was put into which layer. Um, and how they called it, which ones they mashed together for certain reasons, efficiency or other, other things. Um, and we'll use this basically to understand the processing. The processing actually is always pretty much similar. So how does this work? Um, we have four layers that make up this, um, this uh, reference window system. Um, and uh, at the very bottom of our model, um, you know, of these four layers, is the graphics event library. Now, uh, that's not where things start, obviously. You're going to press a button on a mouse or something, and then um, that event is being generated in the device and being picked up by the driver. Um, and so there's something going on before that, right? The hardware 
sits below this model. Um, from the graphics event library, then uh, you could imagine events basically you know, percolating up this abstraction these abstraction layers, um, making it into a base window system. Uh, we'll talk about what that does. Uh, possibly being handled by the window manager, which is sort of the user's user interface to, to manipulating and moving around windows. Uh, and then ultimately making it into what's called the user interface toolkit, which is um, a bunch of collections called widgets, interface elements that make up the UI of an actual app. Um, and on top of that sit the applications that people are developing. Um, as we go up this, this thing, you know, as you would expect, things get more abstract, obviously, but they also, in terms of how we, the, the concepts that each layer handles are, are getting more and more um, user-centered. So they're in more in user terms rather than in technical uh, or device terms. Um, the uh, question, one question here is like, where's the operating system? Because um, we're not seeing an operating system in here and that might be weird. Now, who here has been running a, a, a Linux computer at, at some point or other? Okay, quite a few people, folks. Wow, okay, basically everybody. Um, so, if you look at you know a Linux computer booting up in, in the very early stages, you essentially see often even today a text-based UI. Or there's often like a command line scrolling by, a couple of batch processes happening. Uh, that's your OS at work. The graphical user interface hasn't you know instantiated itself yet, um, and that is also the the static architecture of um, you know Linux-based systems. You have a, a Linux kernel, a Unix-based kernel. Um, that is essentially providing all the things that you've learned in operating system classes that you need for every operating system. You know, memory management and process management and, and you know, multi-threading and all those kinds of things. Um, file management, etc. And then on top of that, there's oftentimes then uh, a layer that starts providing all the services and things that you need to have a graphical user interface. Because that's how these things originally developed, right? You had computers that were already able to do textual UIs, and then people started putting stuff on top. They said, I want to still use that old computer, that old OS, but I want to put something on top of it to create a GUI. Um, that's how you know, early versions of Windows work. That's how you know, the X-Window system that was running on, on Linux and Unix machines for the longest time uh, worked. The Mac is a little bit different because it was built from you know, the ground up as being a, only a graphical user interface based operating system. But even there, you've got the same kind of layers of, of functionalities or packages of functionalities. Some things you don't need when you don't have a GUI and other things um, you, you always have to have. Right? So that created a, a layering. So anyway, what I'm trying to say here is the basic OS that we tend to think about usually um, with file management and, and those kind of low level resources that are not necessary uh, only for graphic user interfaces tends to be somewhere in here. So, for example, um, you know, a USB driver uh, would be connected, would be, you know, what takes care of, of you know, reading out a mouse that's being plugged in, um, and that's part of an operating system call, or operating system layer, or framework, and that would then pass things on to higher level um, parts here of this actual window system. The other question that often comes up is, uh, where is the user in this? So I'd like you guys to take a take a guess at where, if you had to paint in the user here, where would you put him or her? Yeah. Well, mainly um, at the app level. Okay. But it's also starting maybe at the Windows Manager already because uh, this has to do with like arranging multiple windows. Okay. All right. All right, so, so um, on the level of the app, why would you put the user there? Well, because the apps are like the main entry point for the user to interact with uh, like the graphical system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and you're right, and you're also wrong. Uh, you're right because that, that is actually the point of this whole structure that as a user, conceptually, like in your head, you are interacting with you know, Angry Birds, right? You're interacting with an app. Um, so 
the the concepts that you have in your head as you you know or you launch the whatever you know db navigator to figure out whether your train is delayed or not so you are conceptually interacting with an application that's providing information to you and you're reading it and you're controlling it to get to the data you want but at the same time you're also doing something on another level and you see where else you are actually um, and it's not the window manager. I mean, you're right. We're also clicking on things to, so we're also conceptually interacting with the window manager because it provides us the services to move windows around. But we're also interacting at another level. Uh, yeah, right there. Also at the hardware level. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that's because while your brain is saying like, oh, I would really like to figure out whether my train is delayed, and it says like, let's launch the DB Navigator app, that then means that you know those sausages here go ahead and you know tap on your multi-touch screen or whatever, or move a mouse around on a desktop, uh, or type on a keyboard. So physically, you are providing hardware input um, at the hardware level, right? And also, then when the app is being controlled by that input uh, and gives you output back and says, uh, "Yeah, your train is you know, on time. You're good to go," that also happens via pixels on screen, which you know your eyes are perceiving. So Again, it's at the hardware level. So we could say that we're actually physically, um, you know, by looking at things and, and, and touching or, or pressing buttons, moving mice around, or um, uh, maybe also hearing audio output, whatever it is that your system creates, or, or a haptic sensation that, you know, a buzzer creates on your, on your wristwatch. All that is happening on a physical level with the hardware layer. At the same time, our brain is conceptually interacting with the app. And that is actually, um, I'm not sure, is that being still, is that still being taught in distributed systems classes, the ISO, OSI, seven layer model? Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a tired nod from a couple of folks. So remember how, uh, if you think about it, you know, you've got, you know, those two towers, right, of, 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 of protocols sitting on top of each other, of abstraction layers, and the protocols actually go across on, at each level, right? So while Ethernet is busy talking at you know the, the physical level, um, you've got you know TCP/IP uh, you know creating a, co a communication at the higher level, and it's just like that here. You've got a tower of abstractions here, and of course, just like in the ISO model, um, these things are calling functions from the levels below, right? From the libraries and frameworks that are provided to them, and they create more apps. You know, things are being returned, and they they work with this. So when your app says I need a button, it asks the UI toolkit to give it a button, right, as part of its user interface. Or if it says, I want to draw a circle, it will call you know, the UI toolkit to do that, and that will somehow go down all the way to the graphics event library, which will push that circle onto the screen. Um, so there is basically calls and returns happening, you know, in this direction. Also, events percolating up here, uh, and, you know, things like graphics output, for example, going down in this layer. But at the same time, on each level, you could say you are interacting, you know, your app or, or, or the system as a whole here is interacting with the user, or the user is interacting with the system. Now, it's, uh, it's an interesting comment that you made on the window manager because the window manager is responsible for decorating windows, putting closed boxes, maximized buttons, that kind of thing onto window frames. Uh, and so we're also conceptually interacting with that window manager um, just in order to um, for example, move a window out of the way to, to make space for something else. All right, so um, let's then go in and, and talk about the graphics event library right away. Uh, so that's the lowest level of our model, right? So we're imagining, um, you know, but mouse button has been pressed. That's always my standard go-to example. Um, and, you know, that event got picked up by USB, uh, got passed on into the computer uh, on a firmware driver level. Uh, and so the basic OS is sitting there now and saying like, oh my God, somebody pressed the mouse button. What should we do, right? So it, it needs to put that information somewhere. It needs to push that up the, uh, up the tree, so to say. So that's one half of what the graphics event library is doing. The event part, obviously. The other part, the graphics part, is responsible for fundamentally uh, rendering graphics primitives like you know, lines circles, you name it. Um, so we basically have these two things. We've got device drivers, um, you know, we call this thing GEL, right, for graphics event library. Um, 
we have device drivers providing this driver-specific data to them, saying like, oh, there's a USB device with the following, you know, um, uh, uh, format, and it sends me this weird data, uh, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, give that to you. That's what the graphics event library gets from the device driver. Um, and what the graphics event library does is, in this reference model, it's not very exciting. It basically just makes sure to make all these events that are coming in from different devices to at least look the same, to be in a canonical format. So rather than the mouse having a very specific you know, format for its events and the keyboard having something completely different, it turns all of these things into system events, input device events, and says, this is an input device event of type mouse, and it has you know, an X and Y coordinate, and it has a, a button state of three buttons on the mouse or something like this. And then when a keyboard event comes in, it takes that and turns it into, this is a system event of type keyboard, and it has the following keys that have been pressed, et cetera. So, so that these things are basically in a, in a unified format. We need this unified format because we're going to be doing some sorting of these events on the next level up. And that only works if everything is in sort of the same uh, readable format. It then puts these events into event queues. Now, these are still event queues per device. You still have a mouse event queue. You still have a keyboard event queue. Um, and maybe others, maybe there's a light pen attached or something else. Um, and on a mobile device, th those would be like you know, the finger touches that are being that are happening, those would go into event queues. Um, but they are all basically, in, in, you've got the event queue, uh, an event queue per device, but they're all in the same format, right? So now the events on all of these queues uh, are comparable, right? I can look at them, I can uh, mix and match them uh, and, and start sorting them. Why are we doing this? Well, because we're, you know, the, the idea of these abstractions, and you know this as computer science, is always to hide uh, implementation details and, and specifics and to make things more um, universally usable, right? To, to make them more, more general. Um, on the other side here, we are getting requests for drawing certain things. Um, let's say, you know, draw a circle. Uh, and that event is usually coming in um, in what's called logical coordinates, meaning that um, they, are, they are not mapped to, you know, like a specific memory address in your graphics buffer or anything like that. Uh, that is what basically the graphics event library takes care of. And today, I mean, this used to happen all basically on, on the CPU. Um, today, you know, graphics cards are doing most of the heavy lifting on the, on the drawing side, but conceptually, that's still what you know, the role of this graphics event library is, to turn these things into actual um, drawing commands or, or storage commands, if you like, output commands to go to the graphics card or whatever that hardware might look like. So that when, I, you know, when, when an application draws a circle, it doesn't have to worry about maybe, for example, you know, what kind of memory structure the graphics memory has or how many colors exactly can be used. It just asks for a certain color, and then there will be some kind of mapping to say, well, I can't give you that color exactly, but I can give you this, which is close enough. Or sometimes the resolution is actually also something that um, is being uh, abstracted away. Right? So uh, we'll talk about certain kinds of drawing formats uh, that basically mean that you can paint in mathematical coordinates. You don't need to worry about the pixel resolution and the system takes care of you, uh, of that for you and maps it to actual uh, pixels. So that's the, that's the you know, downward facing stream of information. Think of this, if you need an example, always think of it as you know, a simple drawing command like draw a circle or draw a line. Right? That's, a, that's a good uh, model and, and going up here, um, you know, think of a mouse button being pressed and what happens to that that data. Okay, so um, now let's talk about those graphics models I was just um, starting to mention. Uh, this is maybe news to you, maybe not, probably not, but uh, I mean we all know that if we boil it down to actually looking at the pixels on, uh, on, on our screens, whether it's a tablet or, or a laptop, uh, or a smartphone, uh, 
ultimately you are drawing in individual discrete pixels, right? These are becoming really tiny, so you know you need a magnifying glass these days to see them, but that's still how the data is being stored and how the painting is happening, right? It's going into individual memory addresses that say, okay, what kind of RGB value do I need to put into this memory address um, in order to paint that pixel, you know, bright orange or something. And um, many systems, all the historical ones, uh, and also many current ones that just don't have the computational power to do otherwise, still work completely on that pixel model. What do I mean by this? Um, take a very, you know, imagine a very early, you know, simple computer, just black and white screen, right? No, no color, nothing fancy, not even grayscale. So it's just, you know, a pixel can be black or can be white. Like, you know, remember the, the Alto or the Star, right, from the, from the 70s, 80s? Uh, so where, back then, the, the great idea was to say, wow, let's just put lots of memory, you know, and dedicate it to this, this pixel buffer, basically, and let the applications paint in this however they want. Right? That was the idea of how you could create a graphics user interface. But it meant that there was memory addresses or memory locations uh, for each pixel on the screen. And then that's, you know, each of those, if it's just a black and white screen, just takes a single bit, right? So 8 bits, 1 byte will be your first 8 pixels on the screen. Very, very simply speaking. Now what that means, however, is that if you wanted to draw uh, something that was I don't know, like, you know, four centimeters high, you would have to know not just the physical size of the screen, but also the resolution of the screen. You know, only then you could actually say, okay, how many pixels do I need to actually fill in to make a line that's four centimeters high? The only thing you could actually do in your app was to say, I'm going to draw a line that's 20 pixels high. Right? And who knows how long that is? It will depend on how big the monitor is that the person happens to be using, but it'll also depend on how high the screen resolution is of that monitor and that graphics card that is connected at this point. So that's a bit tedious. But given the fact that it's a bit tedious, it's amazing how long that system survived. Uh, when you look at the major operating systems like Mac OS and, and, and Windows uh, and Linux, it's only been in recent years that they have really fully moved to letting applications draw resolution independently, meaning that what I want to do as, a, as an application is I want to draw a line and I want to know it's going to be, you know, four centimeters high and let the system take care of the rest. You know, let the system take care of the question, how many pixels is that actually? Or in the case of a, of a diagonal line, you know, figure out, okay, which of those pixels do I actually need to set so that it looks like a nice smooth line even though it's made up of rectangular small pixels. Um, and when I don't have that support, this vector drawing support, uh, then that means that if I draw a line on a low resolution screen, it'll, you know, it'll be as good as it can be, of course. But if I take that exact same pixel order and put it on a high resolution screen, I'm creating a drawing that's more pixely than it would have to be. I want, you know, as an application, I really want the system to always give me the best rendering possible. But that wasn't the case until quite recently. So you can still see that if you um, take a look at the, the user interface components that make up, for example, the close box or something in a, in a window or on a Mac, these little you know, red, green, yellow uh, dots. Uh, for the longest time, those were still sort of pixel images, right? meaning that if you put them on a, on a different resolution screen, they're look, going to look a tiny little bit blurry because there are pixel images that then basically get uh, rendered onto uh, the, the, the different resolution screen as good as, it, uh, as they can. Whereas if that was actually a vector drawing, it would always use the best resolution that it can get from the screen. So um, the raster up model then is the original graphics model that you know, used to be used by all the systems in the in the early days, it's perfect for bitmap memory, where you have just you know one pixel per uh, one bit per pixel. Um, it means that you have an absolute integer coordinate system. You can easily tell when you have a drawing uh, when you have a drawing command in your in your library in your, in your, in your uh, application programming interface, and it, it says you know 
whatever, or 100 comma 80, right? That means 100 pixels to the right and 80 to the top or bottom, depending on how your uh, point zero is being set. Uh, that tells you that you are painting an integer coordinates, basically. Um, this was basically great as a breakthrough from moving from text systems, but it wasn't so uh, scalable once you got to different resolutions. And the vector model means that I'm using a normalized coordinate system. I'm drawing in mathematical coordinates, if you like, um, and I don't have to uh, know exactly what the resolution of my screen is in order to figure out um, how many pixels I need to draw. The original implementation of this vector model here was done using display postscript. Now, does anybody here know what postscript looks like? I mean, you've all used PDF. PDF is essentially a modern version of compressed postscript code. Um, but, you know, you, you can also still store things in, in postscript or see what gets sent to a printer. So postscript was invented for printers. It's a simple language that basically, it's called postscript because it actually has a postfix syntax. So if you want to, you know, uh, two plus, instead of two plus three, you would put like two, three, and then the, the operator plus. The whole language of postscript works that way. And it basically says, you know, if you want to draw a circle that's, um, you know, like at point 80, 80, and it has a radius of 50, you'd say 80, 80, 50 circle. Right? That would be uh, how postscript code looked in the original times. And that was designed to send graphics to printers, because if you send 80, 80, 50 circle, that's very short. And then the printer figures out with its very high resolution what that actually means and what kind of pixels it actually needs to set on the page. Um, so very convenient saves a lot of communication overhead between the computer and the printer. And then when um, these graphics screens came around, after a while, when computers became powerful enough, people said, why don't we paint in the same way to the screen? You know, let's just say that the screen and the, our graphics engine is actually able to do this whole rasterization, this turning into pixels for us, and I'm just going to tell it mathematically, you know, um, 80, 80, 50 circle, and you know, it's going to translate that. You know, in, in those cases, those 80, 80 would actually mean millimeters, for example, right? Um, and it would turn that into pixels for me. I wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, so that was the original way of doing this. Um, systems like Muse, the, uh, um, uh, an early Windows system, uh, used that approach, for example. And you have a reading assignment um, to go over some of those classic Windows systems that also int briefly introduces this reference model. Uh, and um, that is part of the Muse book. That was part of the book uh, that introduced the Muse Windows system. What that also introduced was uh, that you could now uh, no longer just have rectangular um, clipping regions, so draw to an area that is rectangular. That's usually what applications can do, right? Draw into a window that is a square of some sort, like a rect rectangle of some sort. Um, once you have this uh, vector-based model, it also introduced the ability to draw into uh, arbitrary shapes, basically. Um, now, there's one trick that works really well um, when you are on black and white screens and you're using the raster up model, uh, and that is the, uh, the trick on how to rapidly make a cursor uh, appear on a screen and then remove it again. Now, imagine you have a, you have a, a memory uh, area there where you're where, where the image is stored, right? And now um, the user moves the cursor across that. It's easy to draw a cursor on top of the image, but how do you remove it again? Because the cursor is moving, right? So you need to draw it here, and you need to remove it there, you need to draw it here, you need to draw it here, and that needs to happen really, really quickly. How do you do that? Uh, there's an interesting trick. Anybody happen to know how to do that? Mathematically speaking, like, or, or Algorithmically speaking, yeah? Layers, yeah. So layers are a possibility. So if you are willing to dedicate a whole separate storage area to uh, your cursor, say like you have one memory area that is the normal screen, black and white pixels to keep it simple, and then you take the same amount of memory and you say that's where I put the cursor, then I, I'm not destroying the original screen contents at all. Um, and I can just basically, you know, move my cursor around on that separate memory area. Um, and whenever I remove the cursor again, I know what was underneath because it's in that separate memory. Um, it's a lot of memory, though. Uh, 
uh, in, well, not today, right? But back then it was. So, uh, and, and even today, you know, if I put you down in front of an embedded system, you know, that runs on, I don't know, like some kind of Atmo, uh, you know, microcontroller, and then all of a sudden you're down to like, oh, two kilobytes of RAM. That's not a lot, right? Uh, so even today, these kinds of issues come up, and we often see graphic user interfaces, you know, very simple ones, um, on these embedded systems. I mean, your washing machine probably has a graphic user interface. Um, and these things are heavily constrained in their resources. So the same tricks are being used again to run these kinds of systems. Now, um, so what could you do instead, instead of having a separate layer? Any idea? All right, so make yourselves ready for the XOR track. Ta-da! It's very simple. So let's assume, assume we have a, uh, a screen. This is a zoomed in area of a screen, right, where we have an area that is black and this area is white. And now you want to paint a uh, cursor on top of that, like the mouse cursor. Um, how do you do that? So you have to imagine this is, you know, this cursor consists of lots of pixels, obviously, here. Uh, so what we can do is we can simply say, wherever we want to place this cursor, we're going to assume if the cursor is a black shape, so it has all its pixels set, we're going to take that and we're going to use an XOR op operation, exclusive OR, uh, with the pixels on the screen. That is exactly what creates this inversion. Right? Because if the screen pixel is black and the cursor pixel is also black, and you use an XOR, uh, it leads to white. Right? Because XOR means it's one if the two values are different. Right? That's a simple way of remembering XOR. Um, conversely, if the screen pixel was white, and the cursor pixel is black, then it will turn black, right? So you can see each pixel where the cursor is now touching or overlaying the screen gets inverted. That's where we, how we get this look, right? So we painted the black uh, mouse cursor onto the screen with an XOR operation, with an XOR combination with the background. Uh, and that has an advantage. It means that whether it's in front of a black or a white background, I can always see it. Advantage number one. Advantage number two is if I want to make this go away again and restore the original contents, it's actually still there. I just need to run another XOR operation on this content, right? Because this is now my inverted area. So if I take that and again apply the same XOR operation, pixel by pixel, uh, where my cursor is, so I basically draw the cursor again with the same XOR operation on the same location, what happens is that this white, black, uh, this white and this black pixel here by being XOR again with my cursor pixels, turn into the original black and white ones. So they get inverted again, and surprise, surprise, it's the same as the original. So that's a very neat trick to quickly draw something onto a black and white screen uh, without having to actually have any memory buffer, like you know, the separate layer or anything like that, uh, because the information doesn't actually get destroyed. It's recoverable. Um, doesn't work so well with grayscale or let alone graphics, you know, color screens, right? So there, unfortunately, this, this idea starts breaking down a little, but oftentimes you end up with, you know, simple LCD displays even today in, in embedded systems where you can do that kind of thing. And you may often see like, you know, for example, text cursors often are done the same way. They just invert uh, what's behind them uh, while they're blinking away. So, um, for each of the layers, the graphics event library and the others, we're going to talk about some of the objects that are part of this layer, and we're going to talk about some of the, um, uh, oops, okay, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the, the 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 functionalities that these layers provide. Right. So on a graphics library object, what uh, what the graphics library often provides as as a um, a data type or a, an object that you can create and, and work with is a pixel buffer. Pixel buffers are memory areas in which you have a coordinate system and a mapping of uh, which memory part belongs to which pixel. Uh, there are a variety of um, different ways of storing this, in, in, in especially when you have color screens. I mean, with black and white, it's pretty obvious you just put pixels next to each other uh, because one pixel is one, um, uh, one bit, and so it's easy to, to store that way. With grayscale, you have to you usually end up using maybe a byte per, you know, if, you, if you're good with 256 grayscale values. 
But with the color, it gets a little bit more interesting because you definitely need a couple of different bytes to store color. So here's the uh, uh, so-called Z format in which I take the uh, topmost pixel and is a red value, goes into one area or that might take up one byte in this memory area. And then later on, there is a, a separate memory area which stores the green values. And then there later on, there is a separate one that stores the blue values. Um, this might look weird, uh, but it actually has certain advantages. The, um, if, you, if you store things in, in the uh, Z format, it means that uh, a pix easy pic each pixel has consecutive bytes. Right? So I'm basically keeping the bytes for each pixel together. Whereas here, I'm storing all the red values first, and then later on comes a separate memory area where the green stuff is, and then later on comes one where the blue one is. Whereas here, I'm saying, let me have the red and green and blue in one place, and then we get to the next pixel and I store the red and green and blue ones again. The drawing is maybe a little uh, uh, sub-ideal. Um, it's kind of hard to visualize what, we're, what we mean here with this. Now, each of these has one advantage and one disadvantage. If you store things in the consecutive bytes per pixel, the Z format here, um, then it's really easy to access all the data for one pixel. So I, if I need to change one pixel, uh, the data is in one place. Right? I don't need to jump around various memory locations. I can find it very easily. But if I want to change one color uh, component, for example, if I want to um, do a night shift effect right, on the display and I want to like, reduce the blue color without touching the other to like, the red and green values of each color, then that's really easy in the XY format. Because here, I can just go ahead and from you know, one memory address to the end, I can go ahead and like reduce all the values by, I don't know, 20%, and I have a night shift. I don't need to jump around and find the blue value of each pixel um, in memory. So pixel buffers are a typical thing you will see when you, know, when you go ahead and you actually need to work on that low level. You don't often have to work at that low level, but sometimes you do to create, for example, the really elementary drawings like circles and lines uh, and, or like little icons that need to be rendered or something, then you will find a pixel buffer typically uh, as some sort of object that this API provides you at that level. Um, what the graphics library also provides is typically uh, objects to, to draw, right? Uh, lines, circles. Uh, rectangular areas of the screen, like images, right? You know, to, to just put on, on onto the screen, or um, a bit, bit more complex objects like, uh, for example, uh, fonts. Right? If you look at fonts, um, they can be done again in two ways, right? If you do uh, have a pixel-based system, so a raster op system that doesn't have uh, any concept of, of vector image art, um, then pixel, you know, each each font, each letter in each font will literally be a pixel pattern in memory. Right? Um, that has a problem, right? Because then if you change screen resolution, you need a new pixel pattern, right? So that's kind of, um, when I was using early Macintoshes, that was always like really painful because you had to install fonts at like, you know, uh, this resolution and then this resolution and this resolution and you wanted a separate one to make it also look good on print, you know, and make it look good on, on the screen, it was kind of painful. Um, if, however, your fonts, and this is how things are done today with true type fonts, you've probably seen that, or open type, uh, these are standard formats today, these are all stored as vectors. So they are basically stored as um, line drawings, right, mathematical line drawings, which then get rendered onto the screen and pixelated and rasterized, uh, you know, based on what resolution is available at the time. Um, and uh, of course, that is slower right? and uh, takes more compute time. Uh, and that is an issue with low power systems. You know, the historical system couldn't do that. Um, you know, desktop systems from the 80s didn't do that. Uh, and nowadays, you know, low powered systems like embedded systems won't be able to do that either. So you'll often find pixelated fonts um, today. As a tiny... Um, Aside here, uh, a, typo uh, a typographical aside, um, you might think, huh, if I have a vector-based font and it's specified as a line drawing, 
then I'm done, right? There's nothing else I need to do. I can rasterize it onto every resolution at every size, right? It can be a tiny letter or it can be a big letter. Cool. Does anybody happen to have an idea why one, raster, one vectorized font isn't enough? Why you still need more information to put it at different sizes? It's a weird psychological effect, actually. Uh, when you uh, when you take a um, a letter, like the letter H, for example, and you draw it at very uh, small size, so for your eye, it's really small, um, and you take that exact same drawing and you scale it up and you scale it up and you scale it up, it will actually look wrong in terms of the weight it has. Right? Uh, weight meaning like how bold or how slim the letters look. So just scaling up letters mathematically, like you know, by making everything, the line width and the length of everything uh, grow in a linear scale, is actually not the way that the eye likes to see and read larger typography. Um, so what you will find is actually um, that if you take a nine point uh, font and you, you, know, you make that, you, you render that out and then you blow that up you know, and you put a, a, a 90 point font next to that so that they're physically the same size, the letters will actually look quite different. Not just because there might be jaggies in there, but also because the weight, the line thickness of certain parts of the letter will be different. I won't go into more details here. This is a typographical uh, effect. And in fact, uh, after a while, these vector fonts like OpenType, TrueType, um, actually picked up that idea and support the proper scaling now. So if you scale up an OpenType font to a larger visible size, it will actually do these nonlinear adjustments. So there's a lot of stuff going on uh, just to put you know, the letter A in front of you on a computer. The next thing that we find oftentimes in a graphics library is what's called a graphics context. Uh, what do I mean by graphics context? Well, it's essentially a, uh, an object, uh, a state if you want, of the virtual graphics processor. The goal of that is to reduce the amount of uh, parameters that we need to send each time we draw something. Um, you know, Im imagine that uh, you know, this is sort of an example for a graphics context. right? So it tells me what font I'm currently drawing text at, what size, what color, uh, and what the current line width for drawing is. Um, and so if I have this, then uh, what I can do is I can just call, you know, in order to draw a string, I can just you know, pass the x and y coordinates and, and the string, and everything else is stored in this, in this, in this graphics contract. I like to think of it almost as a, a, a painter's palette. Right? So I, I pick my colors, I pick my brushes, and that's the stuff I'm using for drawing until somebody else tells me to, do, to use something else. Imagine instead doing 100 text uh, uh, drawing commands, and each of them would have to say, oh, I still want to draw in the color black. I still want to make my lines you know, two pixels wide. And that would be a lot of parameters to pass into um, the uh, graphics event library for every single drawing call. So that's usually being avoided by saying, I'm going to tell you what color and line width we're going to be using. And then there's going to be a bunch of line drawing commands. And just use what I told you until I tell you something else. Right? Reduces the amount of stuff that goes across the API. There's finally, for the graphics library, um, three different modes of drawing. Uh, and these can get you when you're writing applications. So uh, let's, let's tease them apart. The first mode of drawing is the one where um, basically the, you know, the window system uh, the person that implemented the window system was the laziest. They simply said, yeah, you want to draw to, the mem to memory to go ahead. But if you know, I'm not going to remember any of what you're doing, except I'm going to put it on the screen. Right? So it goes into screen memory if you draw something. Uh, but if somebody uh, then replaces something or draws something else, then I'm not going to remember that. Um, 
that is okay, but it means that you as an application are responsible for remembering what was being drawn. For example, if you know this area then gets covered later on by a window that pops up and gets revealed again, you know, nobody will know what was there. So you will have to redraw the contents. Oftentimes this is done by the app having its own uh, back, you know, buffer basically where it draws everything and then it copies that stuff over to the uh, to the virtual to the actual display memory. So the application is doing a keeping a backup copy of everything to be able to fill everything in any time the operating system says, oh, I lost part of the screen here. Can you tell me what, what needs to go there? The other way to do this is uh, that the graphics library actually provides some sort of backup. And one way to do that is that the graphics library may remember the commands that were sent to it to draw stuff. Okay. Imagine the graphics library every time uh, the application tells it to set the fill color to green, to fill uh, a certain path that's being passed as a data structure, to set the color to orange, and to fill the, this other path of the deer. Um, so every time one of those commands comes in, the graphics library could do that and you know, write a little logbook entry, right? Say like, that's what I did, that's what I did. So then if this content gets destroyed, it could go back and say, I'm just going to rerun this com these commands again that I wrote down in my logbook. That is command buffer drawing. It means that the application no longer has to worry about keeping track of all these things um, because the graphics event library can restore display contents whenever it's necessary. The other way to do this, and that's what you see more frequently, is data buffer drawing. Meaning that um, when the application has drawn some, uh, draws something into the graphics event library. Um, the graphics event library puts it on the screen, but also keeps its own backup. Okay? So that when later it needs to restore anything because the screen got destroyed by something else, then it will be able to do that uh, restoration on this level. So uh, basically data buffer drawing is something where you draw at the same time into the actual window where you're rendering and in parallel into backup and memory. Um, that, of course, costs more memory, uh, but it's very simple to implement. Right? You just basically do the, do the operations twice. Now, um, damage repair can be done by also various players. right? So imagine you actually um, have uh, an application that draws something on the, uh, on the screen, uh, like this blue square here. Uh, it could be a window, right, drawn by maybe one application. And then, you know, this is your mail window. And then something else comes in and it puts a browser window on top of that, right? That's great. Browser launch, put a window there. So now the user closes that uh, browser window. Uh, what was here? Right? What was the contents that, that went into this, uh, this space? Well. Um, if you have any of those buffered modes, the command buffered mode or the data buffered mode that I just introduced, uh, then the GL can say, don't worry, I got a backup, I'm going to fill that in. Right? Either by rerunning the commands to draw the contents or by just copying the contents over from its own backup. If that is not the case, if you're in a syst if, if the window system is a direct mode drawing sy window system, then that means that the application needs to know what it put there. So, if this is you know, the mail application, uh, then in this case, the Windows system would say, dear mail application, I'm sorry, I lost sort of a quarter of the window content that, that I was displaying for you. Could you tell me again what needs to go there? And then that means that the application needs to basically redo that. So either way, um, at some point, you know, that stuff uh, needs to get, get filled in. Uh, I should say that uh, this is, these are the usual modes of, of uh, recovering uh, lost content, although uh, mouse cursors are, are usually always drawn on the level of the graphics event library. Um, so the GEL usually always takes care to draw and move and restore uh, whatever the mouse cursor is destroying, simply for per performance reasons. Right? Imagine every time the user moved the mouse by like one pixel on the screen, that would be a call to your application saying, ooh, mouse cursor moved by one pixel. Could you tell me again what needs to go into those five pixels next to the mouse cursor? 
that would be very expensive. Right? So that's not how this works, which means uh, that when you are um, writing a normal application, you actually won't even hear of any mouse movement across your window. Right? So imagine that, you're, you know, you're, you're an application developer, you wrote a, I don't know, a drawing app, and the user is moving their mouse across your window. Um, you won't know that's happening unless you specifically registered for those kinds of events. Usually you will only hear from uh, the window system once the user clicks somewhere. Right? As long as they're just moving the mouse, even though it's constantly destroying your content, all that is being taken care of by the system for you. So you as an application developer don't need to worry about those kinds of um, image uh, destructions. So, um, you know, that's why you know, this kind of stuff uh, doesn't happen because the GEL uh, fills that that way, it takes care of it. So, is this, um, when do we do the, uh, we have a slide announcing that, but even better. So, okay. Yes, go ahead. Regarding the um, command buffer mode, yes. is it always the case that the whole window is then redrawn, or is there some mechanism to determine which part of the window was destroyed and yeah. only? Yeah. So, so a uh, when you do get a redraw request from the window system, let's say, um, you know, or uh, let's say the window system wants to redraw a certain part, it will always know which part exactly needs to be redrawn. So. By default, it doesn't have to be the entire window. However, unless you have some very clever uh, algorithms going on, you usually, if you have a command buffered uh, mode, you will need to basically rerun everything because you know, the clipping regions of each command may not be known. If you have a logic where you know, uh, you look at each command and you say, okay, this is only touching an area of the screen that's over here, the bounding box of that command is over here, I'm not gonna run it because why should I, it's already there, then that's great, right? So if you can figure that out, that's cool. But usually, uh, you won't know. Right? And there may be things that overlap, that part of it is in the destroyed region, part of it is outside. Um, unfortunately, computers are too fast these days, but when they were really slow, uh, you could see some of that redrawing happening, right? If you had an, uh, an X window system running and it was running over a slow network connection, you could literally see how it repainted parts of the screen multiple times sometimes, uh, essentially wasting cycles, but that was just you know, the, as optimal as, as it could get. So that's the graphics library. Let's talk about the event library. I mentioned earlier on that the mouse driver uh, is what we assume as a given, right? So the hardware operating system have delivered us uh, some mouse driver events. And here's an example. Uh, these are one, two, three, four events um, that could be in the mouse driver event queue one after the other. You can see the timestamps here, 31, 267, are slowly going up, right? Um, so these are events that came in uh, in that order, right? So the timestamp keeps going up. Um, the first event that came in just said that the Y coordinate has changed by plus one. So meaning that the mouse has moved the tiniest fraction to the right, right, by the user. Um, the second one that comes in is a little later, which says button one has been depressed. Right? So now button one has been pressed, no, no X, Y changes. Uh, the third event that comes in says button one has been released. And the fourth one that comes in says uh, the mouse has been moved into X and Y direction. Right? It's X, sorry, did I say to the right here? That's rubbish, right? Y would be up and down, never mind. So um, with the X and Y coordinates changing, that means it got moved six pixels to the right or six units to the right, whatever that means in the sense of the mouse, six sensor units to the right and one sensor unit up, let's say. Um, so those are four events and you can see they're mouse specific, right? So what the event library does is it turns it into um, events that are all in sort of uh, a similar form and they could also get mixed then later on with keyboard events, for example, um, and they would have names, right? So these events would be called, for example, this is a movement event, uh, and there might be some kind of uh, mapping or scaling going on that says, what does it mean when the mouse moves one sensor value to the right? Because, for example, the mouse will have a certain DPI resolution, right? And if I get that DPI resolution by talking to the mouse via USB, then I know how much I should actually basically turn that movement into to make the mouse move on screen, let's say. 
um, here's a mouse down event, a mouse up event, and another movement event. Right? So you can see uh, these are then in formats uh, that we call canonical event, uh, uh, canonical event format. Let's take another look at, uh, let's just zoom in on this data to you know, let you guys read this properly. Um, but you got good eyes, right? You figured that out. So here's the, the, here's the canonical event cues um, for this. Um, the, one, the mouse cue that we just talked about, like you know, movement happening, mouse down, mouse up, more movement happening. And there would be more like this, right? So there would be a keyboard cue um, that was also delivering its own kind of specific event format that was also turned into the same standard event format that we marked with this blue event label here that said, oh, the key I got pressed and uh, one got pressed and one got released and zero got pressed and stuff like this is happening. Sorry, I got released. So this is basically somebody in the middle of typing I-10, right? What a, what a coincidence. Um, and here's the trackpad cue, right? That could be another one um, that is different from the mouse cue, has originally its own kind of you know, driver data, but it got canonicalized, standardized basically into events that are called touch start and, and touch end uh, events. Now we get to the mouse event demo. Um, so uh, you'll be plugging in, right? And the idea of what we're doing here is, uh, this all sounded very abstract and, and historical. I'm gonna freeze maybe. Although it doesn't need to, you can just, you can just plug in. Um, and we, we just wanted to show you that actually, you know, modern Windows systems uh, work exactly like that to this day. So uh, what we have is a little demo uh, that Oli is gonna run uh, that shows you how um, you can basically write a bit of C code um, and that C code posts an event into the queue. Because events usually come from devices, right? Drivers uh, deliver them, but the, there's also a way programmatically to inject events into the system. And that's needed for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, if you write an accessibility mode where people can move the mouse by pressing the key, uh, keyboard, right? Because they can't use the mouse. Uh, then you need to programmatically make the mouse go to certain places. And we're gonna use that kind of function. Uh, and sure enough, you know, we are down into, in the depths of C programming. This is not, you know, this is not Swift. This is not Objective-C. This is not even C++. It's plain old C. Um, and on that level, uh, you know, there are functions that uh, are provided. I think it's Core Graphics, right? Yeah, Core Graphics API that is basically you know, the stuff that takes care of the graphics event library things in Mac OS today. Um, so I'll let you, uh, I'll let you uh, do that part. And do you need this? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, as Professor Bosch has just mentioned, uh, you have learned everything about uh, the reference model in theory, you have seen the concept and we wanted to show you that this model is actually applied in current OSs. So we take the example of Mac OS. And when you want to do this, um, the library you have to look at for the graphics and event library um, is the core graphics library. So as you already see here in the documentation, it makes it very obvious the core graphics library is a library for lightweight to do 2D rendering. And also when you just go to the overview and uh, have a further look here in this paragraph, you see that for Mac OS, um, that this framework, the core graphics framework, is also responsible for the user input events. And there, then you find everything you have seen in this lecture until now. So when we look at some, uh, yeah, have a deeper look into the library, we quickly find, uh, for example, here the CG context, uh, CG stands here for core graphics, but this is more or less what you have learned about the, um, the context object of the uh, GEL. And there you also see when I scroll a bit down that you can set uh, stroke paths that you can, and then I find it some alpha values and so on before I'm in, the uh, in the CG context to draw your path-based drawings. And on the other hand, on the input level, um, we use the Quartz event services where you have all about yeah, creating inputs. Uh, in our case, we will see a demo later where I will create mouse inputs using that. 
And yes, so the GL exists, and if it's about macOS, you will find it in the core graphics uh, framework. Yeah, and to demonstrate that we can directly access this uh, layer and it's not hidden somewhere uh, or something like this, we will show you some code. Um, and this code is here. And um, yeah, what we more or less do is, yeah, we simply move our mouse cursor without me doing anything. So let's show you what this code is doing. So this is a very short, a C terminal application, and when I click on play, you see my mouse cursor moved, and whatever I do, the mouse cursor is always jumping back to this corner, and also when I try to do something else, you see I directly inject those mouse events uh, to this layer, and so now I can't do anything for the next 30 seconds. Um, <coughs> now, okay. Um, and yeah, the code for this is very easy. I can also provide this to you in Moodle if you like to. Um, what we do is we simply import the core graphics library here. Then we have here the, the standard C main function um, and in a loop such that this demo takes at least some seconds, at the, uh, here 20 seconds, uh, we create a point create here with the core graphics uh, framework a mouse event, um, which gets some parameters which are not that important here. So here where the input originates from, here the, we declare that it's a mouse moved uh, operation we want to do, the destination we have created before. And also one parameter we can ignore, which is the button we have used, which is just there because it has to be for mouse movement, we don't need any button uh, presses. Um, this is ignored in the call. And yeah, and then we just post it to the layers, uh, to, to this layer, and uh, then the Windows system is doing everything by its own. Um, yeah, and of course we are sleeping for one second such that, again, this takes some time and you can observe the effect. Yeah, and uh, that's already it. <laughs> So uh, I, I hope the the demo illustrated that uh, we're not talking about you know, made up concepts here. I, I always like to ground these things in, in actual you know current current tech as well. And uh, I think this is a great example of how you can go in and, and find exactly those calls we're talking about. Find the data structures we talked about, like you know an event or um, the fact that there is a a graphics context. Um, and you know when you browse through the API. Now, knowing this concept of a graphics context in general will help you, you know, find your way around these APIs more quickly when you encounter a new platform as well. You know, oh, okay, this is done now. Conceptually, this is the graphics context we're talking about, but you, the name is different. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Uh, I have a question. So, sometimes in, in programs, we have like shortcuts on the keyboard which require like several button presses to happen simultaneously. Yeah. But all these buffers are in a serial fashion. Mm -hmm. um, is there like a threshold of time in most systems, like standard time, to figure out if button presses are simultaneously? Because, like yeah. for example, if I do command C, command V to copy and paste, yeah. it would be like uh, command pressed, maybe, and then uh, C pressed. And yeah, then. yeah. Uh, so uh, two answers to that. First of all. If you're just talking about things like um, uh, keyboard combinations, like keyboard shortcuts, like Command C, for example, or Control C for the Windows fans here, um, then that's an easy one. Because what happens is you basically, uh, th the trick is that an operating system will clearly distinguish between depressing a key and releasing a key. And the only way you can trigger a keyboard combination like that is by having uh, Control pressed, like depressed, held down, then have an event where you, for example, press the X key down, right? And then you've basically got a combination of both of them happening at the same time. Uh, and at that point, then, you know, letting X go again and letting the control key go again. So if that order is being observed, then I know that you've done this. And uh, you can try this out yourself. W what happens if you press control 
then press X, and before letting go of X, letting go of control. I don't know, it's, it's, a question, it's a design question. Like what did the designers of the system decide that should mean? So the semantics of, of pressing and depressing are very subtle uh, if you come to keyboard combinations, uh, but this is how you can catch these. So these are easy, we don't need timeouts for those, right? Because there's no, you can hold down control and you know, have your lunch and then press X. It's still gonna be, you know, it's still gonna be a keyboard combo. Now, the other answer to your question is really interesting and it's really tricky too, because um, let's think about the uh, mouse double click. Right? What's a double click? A double click is actually two individual clicks happening. So we've got a uh, button one, let's say, down and a button one up. And then we have another button one down and button one up, right? After that. And the question is, when should this be treated as a double click? And when is this just two single clicks? And in fact, that's, again, it's a design parameter inside the OS, inside the window system, that makes that decision. So what's happening is that typically, when this first click comes in, it's being treated as a click, but if a second click happens shortly after that, then that second click isn't reported as another second click, another single click, but instead is removed from the event queue, and instead injected is a double click event. So that the application then knows, oh, I had a double click happening. Now whether you also first react to the single click or not, again, is a design decision. If you don't do that, then that would mean that every single click I do would be ignored for a fraction of a second until the timeout for the double click has expired and only then the application would react. It's a possible design, but it would introduce a delay that, you know, thinking about Bloch's law and all that kind of good stuff and the CMN model would probably be problematic. So typically, and again, you can try this out with your system. If you do a single click, it will probably immediately trigger and if you do a double click, then you know you basically get a single click and a double click in, in sequence. Plus, interestingly, in classic Mac OS at least, I don't think you can do it today, but in classic Mac OS, you were actually able to tune this. Well, in fact, I think you still can. You can still set the double click interval, right? Because if you're you know, a young hyperactive kid, then you probably need like, you know, five milliseconds between this, right? Because you're gonna be like click, 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 and all of those should be single clicks, right? But if you are, you know, a, uh, a little more sedate person or you've had a long party, then you might want like, you know, 500 milliseconds time to do a double click, right? Um, and so you can actually set that interval that says like, when should I consider the second click to be not a second in in individual one, but actually be interpreted as part of that double click event happening. So when that gets removed uh, from the upcoming queue, you know, gets silent and you discard it, and instead the system injects a double click event at that point. So um, interesting, uh, complex answers to a simple question. Uh, good one, uh, yeah. I just have uh, a similar problem. Uh, we played around in our, like, back in the um, menu controller lab in the bachelor uh, with uh, trackpad or touchpad, and yeah. it was really difficult for us to distinguish between between drags and clicks because uh, when a user is clicking on a touchpad, often it also is moved around. It slides, right? And yeah. Um, yeah. how much it has to move between the click and the release to be a drag and not to just yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you were in the designer's seat at that moment, right? And uh, it's it's amazing how many of these design decisions are have been made in a modern, like, or even a historical operating system, all these decisions need to be made. And imagine if people are making these decisions that have never heard of Bloch's Law or the CMN model, right? And that you know, did happen for quite a lot of times. And then you get to systems that just feel clunky or like, you know, hard to use. People always had this, like in early versions of Windows, the mouse, if you compare it to how the Mac mouse moved, it was something was off and felt kind of like, eh, kind of like clunky. And it had to do with basically, you know, the, the, the intervals and the frequency at which it was being tracked and updated. Uh, just a little bit more smoothness made all the difference to, to the end user um, in terms of how responsive it felt. 
So yeah, it's that's why we teach TIS one before we do TIS two, right? Because all these things need to be in the back of your head so that you make the right complex technical decisions here that are informed by what you know about how humans work, you know, from TIS one. Um, okay. So let's look. Let's wrap up with the the GEL. So the GEL uh, has there's one more question uh, that is. How much can I mess with the graphics event library? Um, and uh, in most systems, uh, the graphics event library, you can use it. So, so not accessible to the application, or it may be a bit misleading. You can use it. I mean, you can, we just did, right? We called functions out of the graphics event library, no problem. But what you cannot do in most modern systems is actually change it uh, in the sense that, um, Let's say I wanted to add a function to the graphics event library to draw, to draw you know, five-pointed stars. Because I'm a big fan of five-pointed stars and all my user interfaces are going to use them all over the place. And I don't want to go and every time draw you know, all these lines, not even in a routine that I write. I don't want all these calls to go across the GL um, you know, API all the time. I want the GL to know what a five-pointed star is. Uh, and when I say draw a five-pointed star, it should just do it just like it can draw a circle or, or, or a box. Um, how would I do that? Well, in most modern systems, you can't. You don't have access to doing that. But uh, there are some systems that let you do that. Um, for example, if you look at X11, um, the, the, the X window system, it's out in source code. So anybody running Linux with X11 on it, you can go in and you can change your source code. Uh, and you can extend your graphics event library that's part of the X11 window system um, and make it be able to draw stars. But the problem with that is now your X11 is incompatible with everybody else's X11, right? So nobody else could actually use that un unless they recompiled their own X11 installation completely, which is a little bit impractical, right? It's okay for playing around, testing, research prototypes and stuff, but not for large-scale deployment. Now, uh, there are also some systems, historically, that actually took another approach. Maybe that approach will you know, be useful to you somewhere in the future when you need that kind of uh, function. So the idea here is make the GEL accessible uh, or extensible at runtime by downloading code into it. That's what the news window system did. Uh, the one I talked about, like where we're going to give you the article shortly uh, to read up on, on these systems. This is the news book. Uh, it's really old. You guys can take a peek if you want. Um, uh, so the news example is uh, where you basically, if you wanted to draw five-pointed stars, you would write the postscript code for a five-pointed star. You would literally take that postscript code, push it into the graphics event library, store it there. It would have a function to, to extend itself with this downloaded code. Um, and then now the graphics event library would know how to do that. And so next time you ask it to draw a five-pointed star, or here we use the triangle as an example, um, then you, you, know, you would just ask it to do that. And Everybody else who wanted to run your code could do the same thing. They didn't have to recompile their graphics event library or their Windows system because at runtime it would be able to basically learn new tricks like a good dog. You know, right? um, another example where you might want to use this is if you, let's say you have a black and white display, like a simple LCD display maybe, and you want to use patterns right, to, to, to show grayscale uh, values. If you can just... <coughs> um, um, push a grayscale pattern down <clears throat> into the memory of the uh, of the GL. Um, okay, so that's the GL. So now we're going to move to the next level, um, the base window system. In summary, you could say the GL basically hides aspects of the hardware and the OS already, right? It it, it covers these things. Um, it offers a virtual graphics machine, you could say. It's like a, like a drawing engine that you can talk to at a certain level um, without having to know exactly how the hardware of the graphics engine works that's beneath it. It's often implemented um, from, a, from a programming standpoint as in the same address space as the base window system. So these two are often mashed together. Um, what does it mean to be in the same address space? Well, you can just call each other with function calls. Right? You don't need to 
do inter-process communication or anything like that. Um, you're just um, calling routines inside the same app interface. Um, you will also find that many of the objects we talked about, like the canvas, for example, uh, will actually come back to us. We will see them again, like the, you know, the pixel buffer we saw on the graphics event library level will come back to us as a canvas on the next level. Um, so upper or higher level um, parts of the, of the window system architecture often have similar concepts, but they are more abstract, right? They have more features. Um, so let's look at the base window system next. The base window system is the core of uh, the window system. It's uh, the thing that processes or that provides all the uh, data structures and resources and operations uh, that you need Windows system wide. Um, it also manages any resources that are shared to both to save resources but also to ensure consistency, like fonts, for example. Um, the base window system has a um, basically provides logical canvases. So uh, windows on this level are canvases that you that basically include the on-screen stuff. So if you have to, uh, if an application wants to render anything on a screen, it kind of needs to put that into a base window system window. And we'll talk about what this, what this thing is. Um, in, in a very general sense, a single window system could have many terminals, like many, many um, let's say, screens and, and keyboard and nice attached to it. It could run many, many applications. I mean, your Windows system on your laptop runs many applications, of course. Uh, and each of these applications has lots of objects, right? Windows, fonts. Um, and in the sense of, in the case of distributed Windows systems, like X, you could even have multiple screens attached uh, across the network that an application could be rendering. Now, when I say um, window here on the level of the base window system, um, I know that in your head you're seeing little windows that have decoration and they've got closed boxes or maximize buttons and, and frames and stuff. That's not what we're talking about here yet. Right? Uh, the buttons that you're imagining are windows, document windows, for example, that you generate using the highest level of the window system, the UITK, the user interface toolkit. So if your app asks for a window to, um, you know, to display a document in, then that's what you'll get. That's what you have in mind right now. On this level where we are, we're two levels down on the base window system, a window is literally just a rectangular canvas on screen or off screen that you can draw into. Nothing more. It's just a space on screen. Not decorated, no frame around it, no buttons on it, nothing. So um, here's what the base window system looks like in our, in our hierarchy. Um, in the uh, direction going up, We've got our events coming in from the graphics event library. Um, and uh, some of the things that the base window system will do is uh, queue or dequeue them um, and multiplex these things and demultiplex them again. I'll talk about that in a, in a second, what that means. So it basically reorders the events coming in from the various queues. Um, and uh, it can also then you know, message the state of applications to each other or uh, manage the connections to remote terminals and stuff like that if you have a distributed window system. But to be honest, the only distributed window system we're gonna be seeing is the X window system. It's gonna come up as an example again and again because it's so different from the others and it has so many different architectural features that we haven't seen in others that I'll often use it as an example. Um, but for example, the distributed window system, apart from X, we don't really see that in, in, out in the wild. On the output side, um, we're getting requests to, to draw things. Uh, we're getting requests to uh, access certain areas of the screen. So for example, an application might say, hey, I would like a, a window of this, you know, of, of, I don't know, 200 by 300 pixels if we're in a, uh, a raster-based um, system. And I would like that to be over, you know, in the top left corner of the screen. Could I have that as my document window to, to draw into? And then the base window system is gonna manage that resource and provide it to the higher levels and, and make it available to aid uh, the necessary uh, memory structures, etc. Um, so do that kind of stuff. 
And on its lowest levels, it will then talk to the graphics library and, and tell it, for example, to, uh, to draw lines or to draw circles or, or to uh, um, handle these basic requests. One of the things that <coughs> uh, I mean by access control is uh, that applications can only draw where they're allowed to draw. Not sure whether you ever thought about it, but if you write an app and you get a window and you start drawing in that window, you can draw things that don't fit into that window. That's perfectly fine. Uh, you're not going to be painting outside your window. You're not going to be painting onto the desktop all of a sudden, right? Not, not going to happen. Why? Because the base window system makes sure that all your drawing gets clipped to that region that you have available. Plus, if the user takes that window and moves it somewhere else on the screen, your application may not even hear about that. Because you are still, in your mind as an application, still painting to your coordinate system of your window, no matter where it actually is on screen. I mean, it could even be pushed off screen mostly, and just a tiny little corner of your window could still be visible. And your app will be happily drawing into its window, not knowing what's going on. So that's the whole idea. The base window system creates this, you know, my little pony happy world for every application, basically, that, so that it doesn't have to worry about what's going on on the actual screen. It just can rely on its window being there, being able to draw into it, and it won't you know, be drawing outside that sandbox. Um, so that's, that's a lot of what the win base window system provides. So here's a couple examples of the objects we'll talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about windows and canvases, uh, events, uh, again, graphics contexts, color tables, and, and fonts. Real quick, uh, window and canvas, what I mean by this is um, a canvas is basically just uh, an area off screen that doesn't currently have a visual representation on the screen. And so a window always needs one of those canvases uh, uh, as well. Um, when you look at the base window system, you'll find that um, a window as a data structure, as, as, as a data type, will typically have an owner, obviously. right? Some application created that window and wants to draw into it. But there could be other applications also drawing into it. How is that possible? Well, take the, uh, the taskbar on Windows, for example. Right? The taskbar on Windows is this rectangular area. Um, and somebody is owning that. Probably you know, the, uh, the desktop application running that, that creates the, that taskbar to start with. But then other applications can put icons into the taskbar. Right? So they need to be able to access the taskbar and paint into an area that technically doesn't belong to them. They're just allowed to use it. Similarly with the menu bar in, in Mac OS. Right? So sometimes these things are shared between multiple users. Um, every window will have an X, Y, and, uh, uh, and a size. Um, so the origin is the X, Y. The size is given in, in, in typically either logical coordinates or pixel coordinates. And then it might often also have a depth, meaning is it actually just a black and white you know, one bit uh, uh, image storage area, or does it have RGB colors or something like that? Um, there's often a setting for a border, uh, like a single line around it. Remember, we're still not talking about full blown document windows with all the decorations around it, like, you know, buttons and, 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 and handles and stuff. And what you can often do to these kinds of windows um, or canvases is you can draw into them in the local coordinate system, saying, if I Draw to pixel zero, zero, it's going to be at the top left typically of that window, no matter where that is on the screen. Um, you can also oftentimes usually change the state of these windows. What do I mean by that? Um, changing the state means that the window might be there in memory, but it might not currently be on the screen. For example, if you, you know, if you on, 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 on your favorite OS, if you say hide this application, and all the windows disappear, right? They are no longer visible. But that doesn't mean that they no longer exist. They're just not mapped onto the screen. So those are states that these windows can have um, apart from just existing or not existing. Events uh, on the level of the base window system, they've been canonicalized. Remember, that's what the GEL did, right? So we now only have one data type event that basically encompasses everything uh, that uh, that can be done uh, in terms of events in the system. And so there's a type, mouse event, keyboard event, touchpad event. There's typically a timestamp when it happened. Um, there's 
data that will depend on the type. I mean, for example, a, um, a, a keyboard event won't have any coordinates or like x, y coordinates or, or movement associated with it. It's just a, just a keyboard ID uh, or a key ID. Um, location for those things where it's relevant, for example, um, when you have a mouse click, you want to know uh, where is the mouse, where was the mouse cursor when that click happened. So that's sometimes stored in there as well. And the window that it belongs to and the application that it belongs to. Now those are tricky because on the level of the GL, I only knew that, there, that the mouse was at this XY coordinate on the screen, but I don't know yet which window of which application was actually the target of that you know, mouse click. I need to figure that out. And that's going to be one of the things we're going to talk about uh, in just a second. And what can I do with these events? Well, I can read them, I can write them, I can filter them. Um, so one of the things that the base window system needs to do is it needs to figure out for every event that's coming in, which application is supposed to receive this event. It need, it's like a postmaster, right? It needs to figure out where need, does that event need to go. And that's less obvious than you might think. Let's look at that. Here's the canonical event queue that we saw before, that the or event queues that the um, GEL provides us, right? So we now have three queues for trackpad, mouse, and keyboard. Uh, they're all using uh, a standardized event format that I can uh, mix and match. Now, what do we need to do with these in order for them to make sense? I've got you know, some events coming in from the mouse, I've got some events coming in from the keyboard, some from the trackpad. What do I need to do with these so that I can process them in the way that the user intended them to be processed? Yeah? Uh, there must be a timestamp uh, related to the mm -hmm. and can yeah. follow it in that way. Exactly. So at this point, I'm expecting timestamps in a canonical fashion, so they are actually using the same clock, right, in a way, in clock format, and I need to sort them by timestamp, right? It's super important, because if, let's say, you first moved the mouse over to a new window, and then you clicked, that's very different from you first clicking and then moving the mouse to another window. Right? In one case, the event needs to go to window A, in the other case, it needs to go to window B. So we're gonna do that multiplexing. We're gonna multiplex in the sense that we're gonna take all these cues and basically merge them into a single queue in order by timestamp. So the event that has been you know, sort of, uh, you know, once the events have been sorted by order, uh, we actually have a logical sequence in which the user intended things to happen. So what's the algorithm we use for this? Can you just sketch me the three line sort of you know, algorithm on, I've got three queues here. How do I get, how do I get things sorted, yeah? Uh, we get an iterator over each queue, and for each event, uh, we check, we compare for all the three, which one is the most recent, and we push it into our order event queue. Right, except we look for which one is the least recent, because we want the oldest event to be handled first, not the newest one, but yeah, you're right. So each time you basically look at the head of all these queues, you pick the oldest event, and that's the next one to handle, right? And then repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, so very simple. Now we have one single ordered uh, line of events. But I said that we need to figure out which application gets these events, right? So that's the opposite of what we just did. We aggregated, we multiplexed all these events into one queue. Now we need to distribute them again to go to the right application. Um, so that needs to happen based on which event was meant for which window inside which application. And that's a little trickier. Uh, I'll show you some examples on how that works in just a second. The base window system also has a few tricks up its sleeve to inject its own events. One thing that it can inject is when, for example, the base window system removes one window because it got closed by the application or by the user, you have this uncovering happening, right? They, suddenly you've uncovered a certain area of screen that needs to be redrawn. In that moment, the base window system will actually inject a new event that says, 
this area needs redrawing and it will be, you know, coming back to our discussion, it will be just that region that got destroyed of that other window. Okay. However this is then handled depends on, you know, is there a data buffer or command buffer drawing model or is the application responsible for doing that? Can it redraw just that part or does it really need to redraw everything? Uh, all that will depend on how things are being, being done, but this is where this event happens. So uh, this is often called like a, a, a dirty screen area, right? An area that was formerly okay and is now in need of redraw, it needs restoring. Um, also, uh, back to our discussion, Andy, this, you know, you know, oh, we've got two clicks happening and that should be really a double click. That's also something based when the system can do and basically take that one thing off the queue and put the double click onto the queue instead. So uh, now all that's left is to figure out, you know, where things go, which application uh, and which window. Uh, and how that works, we'll get to in just a second. But let's look at some of the other objects uh, that the base window system provides first. So it has, again, a graphics context. Um, now you may have wondered if the GEL has this one palette and calls to the GL will set it to say, do all your drawing with you know a black pen in this width, right? And then it, you get drawing commands. What if another application starts drawing? Because I mean we have lots of applications that will be requesting drawing commands from the GEL. So here I am drawing something with a black pen in you know two pixels width. And then another app is currently drawing something else somewhere else on the screen in red color in three pixels width. How does that work? How does the GL keep its palette straight? Well, the GL only has one palette. So the way that this works is that the base window system, this next level up, actually provides separate palettes for each application. So while application A has a palette, the graphics context, on the level of the base window system that is set to black two pixels. The moment that application gets drawing for like a few milliseconds to, to draw to um, the screen when it's its turn, then the graphics event library will load its graphics context with that graphics context from the base window system level of that app. So that app says, I'm currently drawing in, you know, with a black pen and two pixels width, and then that's happening. The moment there is a context switch, so a new application gets you know, drawing rights to, to send a few drawing commands to the graphics event library, that will switch, get switched out. So the graphics context in the GL will get reloaded with the new content of this other application that has different settings, you know, red pen, three pixel wide. So that's why we have um, graphics context again on this level but there are more than just one. There's one basically per, per app. Okay, <clears throat> um, other than that, it has typical things like text, graphics attributes, um, and also maybe a reference to a color table. I'll get to color tables in, uh, later on. In fact, next slide. Yeah. So color tables, um, if you have all the memory in the world and all the compute power in the world, you don't need to worry about color tables. Right? Usually, if you have, uh, if people are drawing to what's typically known as like a, a true color display or a true color uh, um, rendering mode, then that just means that I am giving you, let's say, eight bits of red, eight bits of green, eight bits of blue, uh, and that as a 24-bit value makes up the color I want to see. All's good, right? That just means you need, every pixel needs three bytes of memory. Many systems don't dedicate that much memory to the display memory because of performance reasons, because of memory reasons, whatever. Um, because, you know, with higher and higher pixel resolutions, that starts to add up, right, that memory for each pixel. Uh, so when you want to reduce the amount of uh, memory you need to store your color imagery on, on, on your display, but you still want to be able to use colors, then there's a couple of tricks. One trick is using um, color tables. So a color table is basically just a list that says, you know, from I've got 20, 256 entries, let's say, 256 entries, and each entry in the color table basically says, has three bytes, an R, G, and B value. So color zero might be black. Color one might be 
you know, a dark violet. Color three might be, you know, a red, whatever. Uh, so you've got lots of room in there. You've got 256 colors that you can pick and choose any way you want as an application. And then what happens is basically when you draw, you just say, this pixel, color 17. This pixel, color 212. This pixel, color 108. So I only need to store one byte per pixel. And when the display needs to decide what color to actually show, it looks into the color table. So I can still paint images with lots of different colors. I can get any color I want. I just can't get many, many, many different colors at the same time in the same window, for example. So that's the advantage of using color tables. And you'll see them quite, quite frequently. Um, so that they basically provide you a way to save, you know, provide the system a way to save memory and also um, performance wise this can be an improvement because it's also quicker to copy, for example, an image from one area to the other if every pixel is just one byte instead of three. Uh, there's a couple of things that color tables can also do. For example, if you ask for a color um, that doesn't exist in the color table, it might have an algorithm to give you the closest match from its current 256 different colors. Another effect that you've often maybe seen in like you know demos or something is by changing the color table quickly, I can actually create very interesting graphic effects because when I change the entry in the color table and I change that dark violet on slot three to a bright pink, that will change all the pixels with you know one command. Right, next time they get rendered, they will be looking different. So uh, that's an interesting way to create you know uh, global effects on an image. It can also provide a default color. If I try to draw with something that I don't tell the system what to use, it'll pick you know, black or white as a, as a default. Fonts, similar thing. So fonts have an owner and have users. Now fonts are interesting because typically fonts are a read-only resource. Like why would you want to change uh, a font data structure? Like you typically don't, right? It's something you just read from. So that's ma that makes it a prime candidate for sharing. There's no need to have 15 copies of Helvetica running in your system when every copy is essentially the same font data. Uh, that's why it's often shared among users and, and only one, you know, the application that first needs it will be the owner and everybody else basically just gets a pointer. Yeah, we already have a Helvetica font here in this memory area, please use this. Uh, what's inside a font? Well, the size, the kerning. Uh, as you know, the font size, um, is something that you don't need to store if you have a, a scalable font, right? Um, but kerning is interesting. Kerning means uh, how far letters are being, you know, are supposed to be spaced apart. Ligatures are these weird two character combinations that you sometimes have in fonts to make them look better. Um, and basically each character, of course, has its own data field describing that character. So uh, increasingly these days, um, these fonts are managed by lower levels, like the graphics event library or, or even lower layers. Uh, but they are managed uh, here. So for example, if you look at the NS string uh, data type in macOS, uh, the NS string class in macOS, it will have all these things uh, that you can set. When you render a string, you can set all these parameters in order to put out uh, some uh, readable text. Now, I said the base window system needs to figure out where an event goes, right? Um, it also needs to hold on to all these windows that are inside the, um, uh, that are inside the, uh, the various current apps that are running. How does it do that? It uses a data structure, usually, that is kind of like a tree. Um, and what does the tree relationship mean in this case? Well, um, if a window is a child of another window, that basically means that that window is fully geometrically contained inside that parent window. But this doesn't mean, this would not be the case if the two windows are parts of completely separate apps. Uh, what I mean by this is you might have a case where you are uh, drawing a, 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 a document window, for example, you know, with maybe here you have a toolbar up here, and then you have a main area where your 
text goes, let's say, like in text editing application. So this area up here, the toolbar, would be a rectangular area, like a base window system window. This area down here, where your text goes, when somebody's typing, would also be a rectangular base window system window. Both of them are contained in a parent, and they're arranged, one beneath the other, in some way. So there is an invisible, the one that the user cannot see, but it has to exist anyway, um, object that contains these two. And so both the text, uh, the, sorry, the toolbar and the main text uh, window here are contained spatially inside this larger container. Right? So they would be children uh, of that base win uh, of that larger base window system window. So on this level, what we mean is a child is when uh, when the child window is beneath the parent window. That means that that child window is also fully geometrically contained. That means you cannot have um, a a toolbar that extends outside the window. Right? That's not possible because that would uh, mess with this containment hierarchy. And that's also true when you play with your with your um, uh, with your OS. You will see that that usually is always true, right? Your, your, the, the parts of a document window or something that you uh, see as one component in your window system, you typically cannot pull apart and um, and, and make extend beyond their parent. On each level, siblings here in this structure are sorted by the Z order, meaning back to front rendering. Why is that useful? Well, it's the, it's the cheapest way to, to get uh, proper occlusion, right? I just render the thing that's way back first, and then I render the things that are in front of it, possibly including it, and when I've done everything, I may have rendered a few things too many times, but I get all the right occlusions in my, in my render. That make sense? Right? Yeah, very, fairly obvious. So, um, let's look at an example of um, this. So this is a little in-class exercise that I want you guys to, to think about real quick. Um, so take out a piece of paper and uh, talk to your neighbor to, to figure this out. Uh, let's assume we are looking at, you know, this, this big thing here could be uh, your, your desktop window, kind of like your desktop background, right, with a window. Uh, I've given it a number one. And then we have a bunch of other windows here on the screen. And I would like you to draw a tree structure for the arrangement of these windows. Now remember, not every window here has to be a document window, or like a new window in Word or anything like that. They could also be things like an icon within a dialog box or a toolbar inside a larger document window. Um, so I would like you to draw one tree structure that would be valid for this kind of arrangement. And as you can already see, the, the clue here is in the occlusions and partial occlusions that we're seeing. Right? Not all tree structures would be valid. So try to come up with one. Talk to your neighbor uh, about the solution or, or what you think might, the solution might be. Um, and that should just take you a minute or two. Uh, who wants to give me an idea for a potential tree structure? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so one as the root. One as the root, okay. And yeah, then uh, as the left most child, uh, we could be the two, two or four. Okay, two, two maybe? Right. Uh, okay, then uh, the next could be four, so next child. Four. Okay, four next, okay. And then three because uh, three overlaps two or four. Okay. And then we thought six on the same level because uh, one could think that it's, it is totally contained in two, but six overlaps three, so it has to be its own window. Right. That's a that's a dead giveaway, right? This would never happen if if you imagine two to be let's say a, a dialogue, let's for example and six to be an icon in that dialogue or something, there's no way that some other window could wedge itself between them. So if six was a child of two, this could not happen. Um, so that's why you're right. So six has to be sort of its own 
That's the thing, right? So it comes over here, maybe. Yeah. And then uh, five is the two child of two. Okay. And seven uh, child of three. Seven the child of three. All right. Uh, any uh, any alternatives or anything wrong with this one? Or alternative solutions, maybe? Yeah. I did the same one, but maybe five and seven could be also in the same level. The others, because I guess we cannot. We don't know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right, without telling you any more about what these are, uh, you don't know the this, the arrangement suggests they could be child windows because they are completely contained in their parent and nothing else is wedging itself between them uh, in a way that makes it impossible. So they could be a, they could be, five could be a child of two, two could be a dialog box, five could be the icon in the dialog box, like the warning label or something like that, but we don't know. It could also be its own separate thing. That's right. Um, in fact, if you push that to an extreme, uh, you could say all of these are, you know, individual children of one, right? possible, we don't really know. And even even one is only the parent of everybody else because I was saying like it's the desktop uh, background that is definitely the, the, uh, the anchor for everything else. Okay, so there are lots of different solutions. Uh, you're right with the one that you gave. Um, that is one, but you know, this is another one that could also be, be possible, right? we, don't, we don't know. Uh, and uh, yeah, also a good job with the ordering. We said like if we have sibling windows, uh, we try to order them so that the, uh, the Z order for drawing purposes is you know back to front. And again, um, that's why we arrange certain things um, the way we did. Um, okay, so um, if we take an, if we take this example, uh, we can actually think about how it identifying a click target works, right? So let's say let's say there's a click event fired. Uh, while the mouse is on top of this window 7 here, somewhere, right? How does the event actually find out which target window it should go to, like which window it was meant for? Well, it would start entering the tree at node 1. Let's take this one here, the, the more sort of uh, natural one or, or less degraded one. And then it would basically ask each child, uh, whether the event is inside it. Right? Each of the direct children will say, like, you know, is the event inside you? Uh, is the event inside you? Is the event inside you? And, et cetera. and the first uh, you know, answers you're going to get back is, for instance, seven is slightly outside to here. Let's say the event maybe happened down here, but it would still be fully included in three, right? So when the three would say, yep, it's definitely inside my window. Um, if you then get that answer, then the children of that window, like seven, uh, would be asked, is the event also inside you? And then window seven says, yes it is. And since seven doesn't have any more children, uh, uh, according to this tree, that means that the event happened uh, on top of window seven. Yeah. Uh, so in the window, in the base window management, how actually are the, are the window, like the parent and the child track, are they with the native pixel positions or how is it done? Like if, when you are traversing from top to down, yeah. there must be a criteria where we say like if we go left or if we go right. You mean in the, in the tree structure? Yeah. Uh, well, so the, the siblings are, are sorted in, in Z order, right? So, so back to front, if if they are, uh, if there is a meaningful ordering of vector font, if they are just next to each other, it doesn't matter, right? But if there's an overlap, you know that you need to sort things back to front. Um, and once you are, because of the, the contained relation, because we know that if something is a child of something else, we know that it is fully geometrically contained in the parent, and we know that once we figured out that the click happened somewhere in that parent, the child is always in front of the parent, obviously, right? You won't have a child behind his parent. It doesn't make sense. So then we can further, you know, drill down and figure out whether the child was hit or whether it was outside the child but inside the parent, in which case it was meant for the parent. And so by doing this, you basically find the, the, the most specific, so to say, uh, window that could have been meant by that click. Because we might click into uh, a button that is 
inside a dialog box uh, that is in front of a document window. Right? And so we need to figure out, oh, okay, so that click was actually meant for the button, not for the dialog box or for the document. And that's what we're doing by making this kind of um, up and down uh, walk through the, through the tree. So uh, the base window system also has a couple of resources that it can share um, because they're scars or you want to collaborate on them. Uh, but if you do that, then you of course end up with a problem, right? Uh, which is consistency. Let's take the example of the, the, the menu bar or the task bar. Um, if everybody could just draw into that thing at will, then you would get chaos, right? For example, if icons are supposed to line themselves up in the taskbar next to each other, everybody wants to be at you know the, 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 the leftmost position, it doesn't work. Right? So there needs to be some kind of management of these resources. Um, and especially if two things were trying to draw to that at the same time, you might end up with a clash and the data structure might get corrupted. So typically, there is a, uh, a way that this is done, and that's by having the data structure have a list of users. So not just one user, but multiple users. And the, uh, there are operations to check the list for which uh, that's empty or what users are in there, to add users, to remove users from an object, and to deallocate de de it uh, when it's empty, when the last user lets go of it, or if the owner, a special user, actually requests to let go of that uh, resource. And um, <clears throat> in order to avoid clashes, like you know, um, corruption of data by having uh, application requests overlap each other uh, in concurrency, you basically have an internal synchronization. So internally, this thing will take one event after one, one request after the other, um, not events, and uh, manage the kind of you know, uh, synchronicity of these events. And you've probably heard about techniques to do that in, in operating system classes. What kind of uh, techniques are you aware of to, to manage concurrent access to, to a resource? Yeah? Yeah, mutex, yeah, mutual exclusive ones. Um, semaphores, uh, you've probably heard about those, or uh, monitors, maybe you've heard about those, message queues. So there's a variety of different ways to do this just to make sure that uh, these shared resources are not uh, being destroyed, right? So that kind of synchronization is uh, either done on the whole base window system or on the individual resources and objects. So the easy way, of course, to make a base window system um, work, uh, how should I say this, uh, reliably with requests coming from many different applications is to make the entry into the base window system a synchronization point. Uh, what that means is, let's say you've got a bunch of different programs running, um, and uh, one application you know, gets its turn on the multiplexing that the, uh, that the operating system provides, and it says, I would like to draw a circle. Right? So if the window system is done in a, I'd say, fairly naive way, uh, it can synchronize simply at that entry point. It could say, oh, I got a request to draw a circle. And guess what? The X window system, for example, fairly old system from the 80s, worked exactly in that way. So it gets the request to draw a circle. And now the X window system the, is going to go off, the base window system is going to go off and draw that circle. And it's not going to do anything else until it has finished that circle. And um, you, know, you could fairly easily crash a, an X window system setup by just asking it to draw a really, really, really big circle because it would take a long time to do that back in the days, and nothing else would be going on while that, that's happening. Right? So while that circle is getting drawn, uh, no other requests into the base window system are possible because it's actually doing its thing. It's drawing the circle, and only once it's done with drawing the circle, it would come back and pick up the next um, incoming request. Kind of like you know, our simplistic application structure when we were listening for one keyboard press or something and then handled it and then only then get got back to listening to the next one, remember? Um, and we talked about this last week. So that's not a great way of doing things, right? So synchronizing at the base window system entrance, uh, but it's a very safe way and it's a very easy way to implement. If you want to be a little fancier, you could say, well, um, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to 
get the next request, and I'm going to start executing it, again, in the thread, uh, so that it happens in parallel, and I'm going to go back handling more requests. That will feel much nicer for the user, because drawing that big circle is not going to stop me from you know, clicking on other windows or, or doing stuff in the, in the system. But of course, if you do that, then you have to make sure that if two requests end up accessing the same resource, trying to maybe draw in the same region of the screen or something like that, that you actually resolve the conflict so that you have some kind of rule who wins basically with access to that resource. Now, uh, we're almost done with the base window system. The last question we need to answer is, how do we integrate the base window system into the OS? Uh, and uh, the, the article that you're going to take a look at from the, that news book um, actually has a couple examples from, from uh, systems on how they do this. So let's look at these, these, uh, these different options. So I'm assuming you guys all had some kind of operating system classes that told you some basics about this, like Betriebssystem, stuff like that. So uh, the, the most basic uh, approach to do things is to just throw everything into one address space. Right? Uh, this is the approach um, that is very simple to implement. It doesn't require any synchronization because there's only one activity in your entire operating system at any time. There's one red thread basically going through your system that never gets um, you know, split up into multiple uh, activities. Uh, there is no concept of a process, in fact. Right? I just have my current point of where my code is, basically. Right? Um, it's a little bit like writing code for a very simple embedded microcontroller with no interruption, nothing. You just line after line, you know exactly what's going on. Um, and early systems were written just like that. Uh, if you don't have a uh, concept of a, a process, that means you don't have multitasking at the OS level, right? But you can still write in a system um, that actually has multiple applications running with multiple windows and users can switch between these. Now, how do you do that? The trick is that when you write code in this way, you use what's called collaborative multitasking. Collaborative multitasking is kind of like the Californian approach to multitasking, where everybody is just really, really nice and gives everybody else a chance to go ever, you know, ever so often. So the way this works would be that you say, um, oh, uh, here's an application that is, I don't know, doing text editing, and here's a you know, text editor word or something, and here's an application that's doing, which is for graphics, and these two applications are running, and then so the, the text editing application would, uh, not just hug, you know, hog sort of the, the Windows system and, and do all its input output all the time, but every time it, it asked the Windows system to do something, the Windows system would say, sure, I'll take care of that, but before I do, I will ask everybody else if they have anything to do. So every time any application asks the Windows system to do something, it basically also gives other applications a chance because when you ask the Windows system to do something, so you're calling a routine from the uh, operating system, from the base Windows system, calling an a making an API call, that's when you sort of let go of your control, right? It's not no longer your code. It's the code of the Windows system. And the Windows system code will then include a secret sort of trapdoor to allow everybody else to have a go. Um, and only then it would return to you. And since that's true for everybody, it means that um, you, know, you basically have everybody collaborating nicely. The way to break that as an application is, of course, to just not have any calls into the base uh, window system for a while. Right? If you were caught in a tight compute loop because you're figuring out all the Fibonacci numbers up to 5 million because, I don't know, your computer science assignment asked you to or something, and you're not making any calls into the window system, into, the, into these APIs, then you're not giving up the processor, and that could actually then lock up everything. So the Windows system would not be able to share uh, you know, compute time with other uh, applications running because you're not giving it a chance to do so. But anyway, that's typically how this is done. And most applications couldn't actually do what I just said. They couldn't compute uh, 100 million Fibonacci numbers because that would break their own responsiveness. 
uh, if you do that without asking for new events coming in, whether the user clicked anything or whether any keys were pressed, if you don't do any of that, then your application is unresponsive to user input. And since that's bad style, all the applications would typically have a very tight loop in which they are asking for user input, which is in fact a call into the Windows system, which means the Windows system gets a chance to you know, make a round robin fashion um, you know, collaborative multitasking. But of course, you know, so early systems, the Xerox star, the Apple Mac classic, um, Microsoft Windows uh, 3.x, all worked according to that fashion. It's pretty cheap computation wise, you don't need a lot of overhead, uh, but if one application hangs and is not calling the uh, OS in, in the right fashion anymore, everything freezes, right? So if you've ever been exposed to that, that's usually a sign of a non-preemptive multitasking uh, going on. So not a system in which uh, you have very high stability. Next approach is to have a, an operating system kernel uh, where you put the hardware, graphics event library, base window system, and then have these things sit in the user address space. Um, if you do it this way, it's actually fairly easy to do synchronization because um, usually kernels are usually exclusive. Right? So an operating system kernel is usually something that only one process can enter at a time um, and that ensures that there's no uh, funny business going on with multiple processes clashing over, over shared resources. So basically that means every time you call something in the base window system, such as you know, draw this character to the screen, um, that would be a kernel entry. That's expensive in terms of computational overhead, but it means that once you're in the kernel, your request also gets handled with kernel priority. So um, it's a fairly easy approach, again, to, to do it that way. Uh, the Sun Windows system worked that way. Um, and uh, another one from sort of, you know, the, the beginnings of Windows systems. And uh, if you need to communicate here, you do this via shared memory um, uh, resources. So basically, you know, there would be memory shared. Uh, and uh, in order to make sure that both don't access it writing at the same time, you have the synchronization over the kernel. Uh, another way to do this is to uh, move more parts of the Windows system into the user address space. Here we have everything down to the graphics event library in the user address space. A, a, a very simple way to express that is if you're running Linux, you can kill these processes, right? You can end them. They are being launched after the operating system has booted up and they are in an address space that you have access to that you can control as, an, uh, as, an, as a user of the system. Uh, this is a model where you lose the priority of, you know, and privileges of being in the kernel. Um, so even the base window system is just a, a user level server, so to say, for, for uh, client apps which are then uh, using it. Um, but it means that you then actually have um, a structure which makes things very easy to exchange. X Windows works like this. So in X, you launch you know, your, your Unix, underlying Unix, and then at some point, you know, a user level process starts that is the X server. And that's the server you can, you can terminate. You can close it and it will end the Windows system, but that won't mean that your underlying operating system is being shut down. Um, this is an approach uh, that requires you then to write your, um, write your base Windows system so that it runs as sort of a user level server process. And then again, you have to deal with concurrent access, right? So how do you make it so that when you have five applications wanting to do something on the base window system, they don't clash over the resources. But you know, the concepts that we just already talked about, uh, with mutual exclusive locks and, and monitors and, and semaphores and so on, help you do that. So we can wrap up with this. Uh, we can see that the base window system uh, has uh, a bunch of different things that it does. On a, uh, on a very basic level, it has objects like events and canvases, um, similarly to the GEL, but on a higher level of abstraction. Right? So the canvas of the base window system is the pixel um, buffer of the graphics library, and events also are now 
um, uh, unified uh, as opposed to the ones that the event library has to deal with. Um, the elementary operations that happen on here is allocating memory for these kinds of objects that are there, uh, queuing and dequeuing events. Uh, on a higher level of abstraction, you could say that um, the uh, base window system is doing a multiplexing and demultiplexing um, on these uh, on these events, um, and it's then addressing them to go to the right uh, window that is supposed to receive the event. And on the output side, it manages access to the possibly shared resources. Uh, you know, allows you to request certain resources, like I need um, a piece of a window. Know, a rectangular area of screen to draw into somewhere. Um, and uh, it uh, manages things like synchronization via mutual exclusion of these resources. All right, so uh, that's covered the two um, bottom parts of the window system reference architecture model. And uh, we're going to take a look at window manager and UITK next week. Um, what do you need to do next? So. Very simply, the first project sheet uh, is going up this afternoon, um, and uh, there will be more details about what to do with that in the upcoming lab. But you have lots of time to complete it. Uh, the way we are structuring it this semester is uh, we're going to start posting the sheet right after class so that if you're all energized and you know buzzed, I, I need to do more DIS2 stuff, you can go right to the, exam, you know, to the assignment sheet and start working on it well everything from the class is fresh in your mind. Uh, but should you not feel that inclined, you have some time, right? So you can, uh, when, the, when the lab run comes around on Monday, uh, we're not gonna discuss this Wednesday's sheet, but uh, there's gonna be a one week uh, delay with that, right? So on Monday, uh, there's gonna be more details about the lab uh, assignment um, or the project sheet assignment that we're giving out. Uh, and you can start, you know, really getting uh, uh, into it then. But that's when you really should start because then by Wednesday, of course, the next topic is going to roll around during the lecture and we're going to pre-release, so to say, the next part of the assignment for you to take an early look at. So make use of that. And the minimum that you should do is probably take a look at the assignment so that you know what you're expected to do and then you will walk into Monday's lab with a little bit of an idea of what to do. Right? Um, and then uh, the time when this first project milestone is due is only the Monday after that. So you've got a whole week, even after the lab, you've got another whole week to work on it uh, and have it ready. Um, remember that the, uh, this project, these next couple of weeks, this is actually counting towards your final grade. Right? So you kind of should be doing those assignments. It's this Windows system reference architecture building, this coding that we do in these first couple of weeks. Um, so you'll have 12 days to work on each of these uh, steps in total with a little bit of overlap. So if you're an early worker, you can you know, do that. If you're a late worker, you can do that too. Uh, we're giving you a bit of a uh, wiggle room there in, in, in both directions. Um, the uh, milestone is due on, on Monday, April 4th, 24th then, and that means that in that lab then we will be discussing uh, the solution to this first project milestone. Right? So uh, by then, uh, that's when the cat's out of the bag and so um, definitely make sure that you have things done by then in order for them to, uh, for us to be able to grade them and, and have your submission ready. All right, that's all I have for today. Um, I hope uh, you got an idea of how Windows systems are structured on the lower levels. See you again for the next class going up the abstraction level and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.